Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. Um, I'm Mark Huxley, and I've got the uh, joy today of navigating us through today's Knowledge Mile's 695th Lord Mayor's Lecture. Are we asking the right questions about profit? So uh, I'll give you a quick rundown how today is going to work. Um, I shall properly introduce our speaker, Paul Vick, uh, in a moment, after which he will speak for us about 20 minutes. That hopefully gives us lots of time for, for questions at the end. Um, there is only one way of asking a question. If you look to the top right hand side of your screen, you'll see a, a call out box with a question mark in it. The clues here, if that's where you need to put questions, please don't put them in the chat. Definitely don't put your hands up because we won't see them and we'll, we'll, we'll miss your important question. Um, we'll get through as many of the questions as we can, but um, generally they're quite lively, lively parts of the session and we get lots and lots of them. Uh, Paul will be sent the questions afterwards, so uh, he can he can get your details and he can reply to them as we we go through. Uh, as I'm sure you're aware, uh, the session's being recorded and will appear on the the dedicated YouTube channel. So again, you can you can catch up uh, afterwards. And that's about it. So I'm going to give you a little bit more of a detail introduction to Paul, and then she'll pass over to you, Paul, for. Uh, for you to, to kick underway. So, um, Paul Vick, uh, professional architect and fellow of the Royal Society of Arts. Uh, he's lectured on architecture at University College London, MIT, National Building Museum. Uh, his work has been published extensively, including in the Architects Journal or World Architecture News, amongst many, many others. Uh, originally trained at Cambridge University, Oxford Brookes University, uh, with extended periods in Washington, DC and Beijing. Uh, as well as undertaking a long architecture training, he undertook a second master's in development practices, uh, which he was telling me beforehand, um, got him to look at urbanization profiles of countries, policy flows of investment, spread of GDP, and final six months study in China around the global forces on development. So what a, what a place to go, be able to do that. Um, worked as an architect in Hong Kong before coming back to the UK, where he, he then uh, professionally qualified. Uh, and describes the opportunity of working for others in the next 10 years as a professional architect in due course was project managing architect at White City and Shepherd's Bush uh, shopping centre and various of the transport hubs around there, drafting the British Museum master plan for the next 50 to 100 years. We won't make you talk all about that, Paul. Uh, and then an 8,000 home zero carbon scheme uh, in London. Uh, each of these are over half billion pounds worth of, of construction. Um, 2007, as a fellow entrepreneur, he took the right decision, founded his own company, uh, Paul Vick Architects. Uh, and he talks of his approach as bringing the understanding and the opportunities of the wider view, its options, opportunities, all the way through to the literal nuts and bolts of building a full size one-to-one -one scale. Uh, very joined up in the, the thinking of the, 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 the business, which you know, we don't see so much of, of today. And he, Amongst the more, more kind of interesting recent projects, completed a glass bridge, uh, fitted out, uh, fit out for a global telecoms company in London, and undertaking the, the design for the innovation warehouse at Smithfield within the city, uh, believed to be the first innovation hub come co-working space. Uh, wrote a vision for the diocese of London, has built out low carbon, new build and retrofit projects, and is working with the city on Keats House, a museum. I hope you do get some time to sleep in there somewhere, Paul. Um, the approach has also enabled him um, to achieve a 100% planning permission record for their clients over 17 years, so clearly designing to, to good quality and style. Um, he puts this down to being better synchronised with the statutory and civic long-term aims and granularity of approach allowing clients' ability to optimise their sites and, and just get often get much, much more. Very much an award-winning practice. Um, most recently, builds best commercial architecture firm, London 2023, most innovative architecture firm in 28, 19 and 2020, best cultural architecture practice in the UK in 2019, best construction advisor in the UK 2017. Uh, passionate about the environment, innovation and culture is going to talk about these with just some of his work in addressing the question that we've put above, above the door about, are we asking this right question about profit? and how we hold the keys to innovation and resolving climate challenge through architecture. I'm going to shut up. I'm going to pass over to you, Paul. So the floor is yours, sir. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much for this kind introduction. Um, 
and good afternoon, everybody. Um, so we're going to ask this question in the broadest sense today. Um, uh, and we're going to go through some of it quite quickly, but please feel free to ask any questions at the end, um, and it will cover quite a lot of ground. Um, and I will, hopefully it will be coherent. Um, next slide. Yeah, and the next one. And the next one. So as an architect, I've often thought, you know, what's all this fuss about, really, in terms of about creating sustainable buildings? We have had off-grid homes and cities for centuries. On this slide, we've got hot, dry heat in the top left. We've got underground dwellings in a different type of heat. We've got amazingly cold weather in the centre, as well as very wet and flooding um, um, environments. So what's the change really about? And today I want to talk about change as much as I do about some of the examples of how we might just go about approaching it together. And I'll try to use the language of economics for reasons will become clear in a minute. And, um, and as a friend of mine in the city, who I was talking to recently said it, it, it's clearly much more than economic gamma and beta curves. If you like. So what has changed? Well, the, the big thing is growth, really, over all these periods. And can it, so we've got growth of populations, commodity consumption, whether it's food, fuels, materials, that might be wheat, oil, gas, water, timber, concrete. And then the other side of it, and how quickly the planet deals with it, with the waste, if you like, as a biological pro process. And on the whole, they're saying it's not quick enough. And in terms of carbon, talk of carbon sinks. And so what has been happening in this, we've seen changing definitions as well of hinterland and context. We've seen these sort of interdependencies of countries in the 19th, 20th century, notions of globalized nation, which might talk of multi no nodal decentralization of centers of influence and that we'll come back to that um and if we look at the next slide um this model coming out of the limits of growth really in 1972 is a good way into it from our point of view really where they said well there is a limit to this growth on this planet and they identified all these items here where the planet can't isn't really sustaining that feedback loop, if you like, um, and they've had a good go at quantifying those. And those things that have gone red is where they indicate that they believe they've gone over the boundary of what is safe and sustainable. And what does that mean if we go over them? And there'll be some form of collapse in a system, if you like. Um, and we're seeing some of those with extreme climate now. But that's only half the story, in re really, because it's not just about the planet dealing with us. It's about us surviving, flourishing, making change, and the granularity of who we are, what we are as people. Um, it's about us as humans, really. And this brings us to the next slide, which is a model that's developed out of that, which many of you may be familiar with, the, this notion of donut economics, where those outer ring is that previous slide of the planetary boundaries, but the inner one refers to us as humans and those sort of social sides relating to food, health, education, deprivation, all those sorts of things that are essential. And again, we have to be between, the idea is graphically that we're between these two extremes really. And that is a, a place there where we can survive well. And that's been reinforced in many benchmarks and places in particular, the UN's Sustainable Development Goals. Next. So sustainability, just as a starting point, this was Brundtland Report in 1987, and many of you will know that definition. But what was particularly interesting to me is the next one, next slide, where she goes on to say that it's not just actually about the technological challenges, that's minor compared with the challenge of creating, here we go, the social and institutional frameworks. In other words, if we go to the next slide, it's not the technological issues, but rather political will and economic incentives. And that is a slightly different story to perhaps what many people have imagined it might be. 
Um, and where we have sort of, so then the question is, how do you make this change? And we can all be part of this, and that's part of why I want to talk about change today, whether we're architects or not, really. Um, where we see devastation on the news, we see it out there, we see even suicides blamed on climate despair in India. Um, so it can be an overwhelming challenge, but is it all bad so far? We've had, and on the plus side, we've seen huge increases of people coming out of absolute poverty. Um, perhaps the more well-known statistics are that since 1994 to 2018, you know, they've moved from 35 percent of the population in absolute poverty to 10 percent. That's a huge change. There's billions of people. We've got repaired the ozone. We've seen impressive increases in literacy. We've seen life expectancies go up. We've seen better healthcare. These are all great things. Um, so the despair, I'd like to try to put one side and focus as much on what we can do and the optimism, because we've still got a long way to go. So look at the next slide. So how do we create, if you like, order out of chaos? and the 1% here is from the pollster Mark Penn, who was worked for Bill Clinton's campaign. And his, his view was that if you could create a movement of 1% of a given population, you would then change, a potential to change policy. And that could then lead to a different leader, peace, war, and I would like to think climate change. So that allows all allows us to think actually and start to quantify that it's probably possible with the right level of thinking. The other bit to introduce out of this sort of order out of chaos idea is that there are different types of intervention, both public and private, whether they are policy at the high level, if you like, the programs, which are more focused, projects which are very physical and what as architects we spend a lot of time doing, and then the what I call the action plans, so what's the next step that we can do? Um, and this notion that power is perhaps more distributed than we may initially think is perhaps never been true. And there are many, many more ways of doing that and influencing, communicating um, than perhaps we've seen in the past. Um, the next. So the other bit of the order out of chaos part to my mind, and and if I'm looking for equivalencies very broadly, we might be looking at where that might have been talking about sort of rational sort of economics from the outside. Here we're trying to look at sort of what well, you might say in this line with behavior economics from us from the inside. We're the people who are going to help to make a change. So looking at it from our side, perhaps we've already talked about our relationship with the environment. Um, next, there's also the next relationship, perhaps of us to each other and how we work with those and the other one and next. And finally, that relationship to ourselves. Why would we do this at all? And it comes down to a very motivating series of issues is important to making this change happen. We need to think about these really. Uh, next. So there's a lot of challenges and how do we go about putting this into sort of solutions next? Do you have the next one? So the system we start to use is how do we, the sort of values we might think are important to sort of bring into, in our terms, an architectural project. Use value, next. Um, and economic value, these are the Marxian pair of use and economic. Use might be our home, it's for ourselves. Economic is how much do we sell our home for? They both have value. Social value, cohesion, next. Environmental value, and we've listed some of the things there that relate to that. Identity value, that is, you know, what do we stand for, if you like? What do we see as ourselves? And finally, cultural value. And what's powerful about this is, if you go to the next one, is if you can plug into these and think about each of these values, you, they can be self-reinforcing. One can help the other. More people on site may give you a better market, more uses. Some level of adaptable use will allow you to have more economic resilience. And resilience is a, is a really, really important part of the equation uh, within this. Uh, next. And 
sort of in general terms, as we think about it, the poetry of it, Bachelard talks about our, our dreams spreading to our walls, and you may have heard about the notion of reflexivity, if you like, where architecture influences us as well in Winston Churchill's own words. Um, to us also, there is sort of no such thing as sort of no design either. There is only good, bad, or mediocre. Doing nothing still leaves a result, and that might not be a good result. Um, and where we're coming from, where we want to go, is part of this equation of how we think about what this architecture is, because it surrounds us pretty much all the time, whether we like it or not, and it influences us whether we like it or not. Um, next. So we're going to talk about some of the buildings very quickly now in terms of those those issues and um, just some how they sort of started to be brought together. This is at Smithfield with Innovation Warehouse and the City of London. Um, it's in Smithfield Market. Next. And the idea is they were growing businesses from half a million turnover upwards. Um, and the spaces varied. There were formal, informal. There were different types of ways of doing the furniture with different ways of connectivity, the ways of presentation, what might be needed out of that. Um, and that, what's really interesting about this is, this, is, this was a, an office very directly for creating growth and new businesses in the sense for those, you know, have a background in urbanism, you know, this notion of the death and life of great cities comes from continuous overturning of businesses and new businesses. And the other thing we did with this is to make efficiency of space, we then used the cafes locally. We didn't need a big cafe here. We could just use the one outside and we'd be part of the growth of the city in its own um, own sense, really. Um, connectivity and the city within itself then becomes part of that social community as well as the economic one and the use wow. one. Um, and it gives us a sort of cultural resilience, if you like. We've got lots of these businesses bubbling away. Um, and with that came out this notion that innovation really is defined as being giving value to knowledge. And that's really powerful as a theme throughout this in sort of enabling us in our own approaches day to day. Next. This is um, a global telecoms company in the H HQ in London. They asked for. The brief was really we want a glass bridge and we want it because we need it as an identity piece to give um, confidence to the people who've invested and come to us and our clients. We then interrogated that and clearly there was more to it that could come out of that. It connects two buildings and need therefore one reception and more. They could have more office space. There's an inherent efficiency to that in terms of space. We looked at it a bit further next. And we managed to get an extra roof space or more offices on the top by just creatively using the light and working very carefully with the structure of the building. Um, and that enables us then to make the most of an existing building, if you like, in environmental terms. And the embodied energy is efficiently used. Next. We looked at the refectory and how these people could come together and create the sort of sense of belonging, if you like. It was sort of just as pa the pandemic arrived, and it's interesting to see how it's been resilient afterwards. And the idea being that if you had a family at work, but at a larger scale, you have created something that, that breeds loyalty, belonging, and including your clients as a whole process of servicing a need, if you like. Um, and again, we had different forms of furniture and, and relationship to create that. And we sized it very carefully so we could get the whole the whole company in there, but not all at the same time when sitting down. So it was enough for group things, but actually on a day-to-day -day basis, you had a different format for using the same space of creating this society, if you like, next. This is more pictures, next. Uh, next. And this is it again at night, next. And here, so this is part of creating its identity. This one we're showing you very briefly. It was a theatre with an office in it. Um, and here, the idea really that we want to convey is that you don't, if you don't need it, don't build it. 
and there's not really metrics for that out there. So in this case, the client wanted a reception for 160 people prior to going in. By keeping it open but protected from the, the rain, we didn't have the requirements or expectancies of any heating out here, for example. We had less material requirements. Again, we used for some of the other facilities, the buildings around and spilt over to them. There's just an inherent efficiency about doing that, as well as obviously in this case, creating a very strong identity. Next. This is a refurb for an office, an industrial building, next. And inside, next. And we, we kept the textures from this sort of 19th century building as part of the patina, if you like, and interest of the building, next. This is a small garden in London, next. Which are, and this, these are plans of different formats of how they might be used for conference and work, for example, um, from left to right. Next. And we've got consent to do this with it. So this is when it's on a day to day with benches on the left, they can be fitted out to create that conference facility. Next. And forms part of a larger project for which we've all got consent with offices below ground and up in a tower. Next. So longevity and care, I'm going to run through this very quickly. How do we create that in architectural terms? Next. And we, we turn to Maslow, back to that sort of notion of us, what's motivating us. These are the basic needs, these four things. Next. And next. And these sort of high, net higher needs relate to our desire for knowledge, aesthetic, self-actuation, transcendency might be for helping others. They're not necessarily a hierarchy. Some people will want knowledge over and above food at times. Next. And so this is a low, low energy house we have built, a first age to third age. Next. If you can create that adaptability, then um, they believe you will leave live longer if you can stay at home for longer and the great there's a massive care movement at the moment to try and do that in this case in terms of the energy on the north side we've got the cellular rooms next uh, and we plotted the sun as it came around through the building to make the most of that passive sun movement next next and you'll see the shadows moving through the house yeah just keep going yeah and we use reflection pools to create light into the main area next. Um, wide opening spaces onto the south side next. Um, and inside this notion of tall spaces and generosity next. 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 And that was very gratifying when our client came back to us with that. And the, the importance of then of knowledge and understanding is a key part then of change. Next. Uh, and we've looked at this at taller buildings as well. The one on the right was a, started with four story existing building um, and with 10 stories was the proposal. Next. And to overlay, finally, this next sense of what I've sort of called cultural commerce, if we can make the most of all this, the senses, architecture is the most immersive form of experience. It's real, as well as having sound, light, texture, people. It will make it desirable and influential. And that is really important to put next to the sort of drier things. So cultural commerce, this was the vision for the Diocese of London. St Paul's Cathedral was their biggest regeneration project and we set up some various things which we can talk about another time about how that direction of issues might be of course environmental and sustainability is part of that next and finally this last project is in 1816 you'll see in the center there a rectangle which was an enclosure for um, a military base um, in Northampton and the line through the middle is 
a spur off the Grand Canal where the arms were brought down from Birmingham and put into this base. Next. By 2016, you can see that enclosure, and now we have all this, some housing around it, but these strong buildings in the middle. What do you do with it? Next. And that is it from the air with these huge buildings. There are eight buildings there either side of the, the canal, all listed with a wall. Next. Um, and the proposal there is truly mixed use. We don't have the natural footfall that we're talking about at Innovation Warehouse or some of the others. So here we've got cross demographics with on the right hand side, we've got low energy family homes. To the left, we've got a care home and independent living and reuse of these main buildings um, for retail and office. And we've also got some accommodation now on the side for business travelers next. And this is what it looks like next. And then we've tied the first thing first, just tidy it up, repair next. They've got swans on that. Um, piece of water at the front. We're opening the ends of this building in front of us. This is where the horses would drive in, pick up the artillery and drive out the other side. Now that's a curated shop next. And here we can talk about this building at length, but it gets, throws up some of the conflicts. You can see an arch in the center there where there was an arch. They then had a, added this building on the le left, which was then a hospital to this building that had been converted into a prison. So it's a prison hospital. They then built, filled in the whole, the door there. And on the left, they created a new door, converted it out of a prison again. It's become the storeholders' quarters. We all have different levels of history and culture, if you like. And it's trying to understand those significance that become part of the story and the identity going forward. Next. And this is a section through the site. It's cut into it next. And that is the lower terrace as it was. Um, it's been derelict, not used well. Next. And that's a, it's a schematic. So you can see we started to put houses in the bottom here, these little things underground, which were, became the independent living based on that model of house we showed you before to allow people to, to be there longer and live well, really, and use the sun and stay low out of the sight lines of these listed buildings. Next. And this is the integration of different types of landscape. This is a plan next. And the proposal on the left is to take some of the existing ideas of these buildings and translate them. So by right angles and create a form that relates to them, but a different next. So we're drawing on our past legacy. And these are the low houses next. And more. More of these again next. And again, you can't see the houses here in the front here, which is the point of this diagram. So they're very subtle within the landscape next. And we've designed an 80 room care home there at the end as well to as a complementary type of facility. Again, cross demographic next. And this is how one of the main rooms of the care home, the communal room, could relate to the historic ca character of that existing listed building, sort of working together really in this cultural way. Next. And so in summary, where are we? So the know-how and technology has been here for a long time. We've seen across the centuries, we suggest only build what you need. We suggest as the next step, reduce consumption, reduce energy consumption. And then use only these high technologies and higher energy technologies when you have to. And in for hospitals and certain you know, laboratories, you're going to have to use that. And I suppose what we're saying is you can't really rely on the grid to do everything for you, which they are trying to do next. Um, the infrastructure is it's good news because across scales, there's a lot of things being introduced that we can use. And we can talk about that later next. So this will to change, in summary, the political and economic next. The economic will and incentive using less is economic. Create new buildings with a long life. The capital cost of a building over 100 years is very low compared to all its other costs. 
and that has implications for financing, insurance, how we think about these, think, incorporate these va multiple values where, that we were talking about, those six values, because that provides resilience for a market as well as everything else we've been talking about. Understanding this consumer and user and expectancy is really important because brand now, it's very easy to call it out if you're not doing what you say you're doing or meeting these wider views and obviously wellness and being that is a question after it. What is a building worth to you that helps you live longer? Well, it's a huge market opportunity, isn't it? As well as one that aligns with us. And finally, next, that political will. Is it policy? Is it programs? Is it projects? Is it actions? And it's all of those things, really. And we all have the opportunity to be part of that. Um, yeah, next. Um, and hence this question, are we asking these right questions to align the granular day-to-day -day with these larger intentions that we could harness? Yeah, next. And next. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. So we've got some questions in there. Um, I'm going to put a couple of questions together, I think, uh, to kick off with mainly because you, you finished up about the political will. And th there's some questions in there about, is there an appetite to balance the short-term wins that politicians look for at the moment? And obviously, we, we're on the cusp of an election now, whatever that might yeah. bring ahead for us. So the kind of short-term wins over the long-term needs that are in there, you know, the tough decisions that have got to be made, made in the built environment and aligning into that, you know, with, with obviously the much publicized uh, drive to, to fill the kind of social housing gap, you know, we, we need good, effective, kind of low cost housing. How do we actually deliver both of those things and particularly on the low cost housing with a very strong eye to the environmental impact that's going to come around the back of that? That is a really good question. And um, hopefully what's become clear in this is that there's probably more than one narrative and there's more than one solution. And we're going to need, in my view, more than one action to achieve that. Um, and so long term, and I, I like that phrase because I, I think it makes a lot of sense. Often when we describe to a developer in particular about things you, you say well who would you ideally like to sell what your product to and he might say well actually i'll probably get the best price if it goes to a pension fund so you then have a conversation about well what are they looking for they're looking for a building that is really really good and it's going to last and re require minimum sort of input really of cost over a generation or two because that is the most cost effective way to do it and as an insurer i'm sure you we'll see this as well. It's quite difficult to join the dots often and the, the measurements, nobody's saying this is easy, but it, it, from an economic point of view, it makes a lot of sense. Um, and that's a start. There's always gonna be this conflict, I believe, between short-termism and longer-termism. So we've got to try to build that in as best we can and make those arguments. Um, and yeah, I, yeah, I, I'm very positive about it all because there's so much being done already. And, and I think also often without outside of our industry within the development world, we don't see how much is actually already being done. And the City of London has got some really amazing policies already about achieve, trying to achieve, you know, net zero for 2030 or is it going to be a country by 2050? Are we going to be leaders in that? That doesn't happen overnight. There's a lot of work that's already been done and investment into that with both a model that that will be a better way to for our resilience and the cost. The longer we leave it, the more it's going to cost us to put it right afterwards as well. And that's neither going to be popular amongst the money men or the rest of us on the ground. And that doesn't really work politically, in my view. Um, so look, either way, there's a strong message for everybody to take on board. And it, you know, and I, I often think of, when I think of Kissinger talking about different values for different countries, and they don't always align, but they're quite pragmatic. 
And you say, if you want to change a value, you might expect there to be a regime change, which is a totally different thing from just working with somebody on a particular issue. And what does that mean for us day to day? It could mean in terms of limits of growth that there will be a collapse of a system. Buildings will fall down or sink. Or, and you see that across the world, not in our country as far as much that I see. Um, and you want to be able to avoid that really and flourish. And I think the other thing that's great about here in this country is that actually that's seen as a positive. And if we can be ahead of that curve and export that knowledge, which is what they've done in the development field historically anyway, then it becomes a strong way of doing the right thing for a need. And that, that starts to align these economic and political sort of ideas, really. I mean, that's how oh. I see it. Okay, and, and trying to avoid the kind of come the revolution, what, what, what can we do as... Yeah, you know, lay people in the streets, you know, we're the end consumers to many of these things. You know, yeah. how do we bring the kind of people power into the middle of this to make sure that we're, we're becoming this kind of collective good corp corporate national international citizen? Yeah. And I, yeah. And I, I well, I, it's a great question, I think. And to, to my mind, particularly to to this audience, this notion of innovation becomes very important, I think, you know, where innovation is that giving of value to knowledge. How do we take the knowledge we have through our professions, whatever it is in, and create a value and ask that set of questions and applying it to that broader scope? And that we know that there's potential there, both for markets, for pushing in a direction that will be help us flourish, basically. And yeah, trying to get on that track is not always easy around the boardroom table, but it is the right one. And there's such huge movements already happening that we can start to work into that. And what does that mean in terms of output? Obviously, there's like the Lord Mayor's le lecture series is exactly that. It's a series of what they said in COP26. They talked about micro communication. It's all just doing it. You know, it's multinodal. It isn't necessarily top down. We can all just get on with certain things to make it better and push in the same direction. Um, other ways of thinking about it, Agenda 21 was part of the, in the Rio conference, Think Global, Act Local, was how do you bring those opportunities, that power, if you like, in engineering terms, they talk about harnessing the great forces of nature, you know, let's try and use those, that tide, if you like, but it's got to be the right way to my mind, and, and work on it. And so on a day-to-day -day basis, that might mean we have a policy within a company, because we talked about private as well as public. It might be a program that we start to look at. It might be a project that we test, either as a business or as a physical architectural project, as well as day-to-day -day just small actions. And yeah, and then that means there'll be lots of different types of solutions coming through. Yeah. It truly will. And that's what you'd expect of innovation. Yeah, that, that I see as the direction. It's very empowering, really. And coming back to that 1% of a population can change pretty well everything. We are empowered, you know, yeah. Okay. So it's kind of interesting because you made the, the observation about the City of London publishing about being carbon zero by 2030. Obviously, it's a very intense built environment across many generations. You know, you showed a wonderful example of, of a brownfield site being regenerated uh, you know, into a modern usage. You know, there's, there's, there's a lot of lot of archi architecture in there, you know, en energy efficient and inefficient in equal measure. Is it kind of realistic to think that carbon zero is a reality in that short time frame, given the vastness and, and the multi-generational nature of, the, of that built environment? Yeah, and I... You've always got to be careful about predictions and forecasts. You know, that's the old fashioned thing, really, isn't it? That the fact that we're doing anything about it, I, th I think is incredible. And the, am the amount of things they've created for renewables within the city already, um, a lot of their buildings are already working at zero carbon operational energy. You know, they've got fields of solar panels. There's the, you know, and there's, the wind farm process, you know, it's taken years and years and years to get that in working. So with that comes how do you store energy to use it when the wind has provided it, you know, it's a and try and there's a, again, as you probably know, there's a huge movement out there of how do you get what they talk about the our infrastructure, our national grid, zero carbon ready, and it's a complex thing. Um, 
so I, I'm really positive about it, really. I think, but it's not just a technological thing. And innovation isn't just about the technology, it's about the knowledge you put with it to make, if you like, you've got the lever, but it's what you do with that lever. And with that comes sort of attitudes as well. You know, when you think of those first slides of, you know, of tents and buildings that were in deserts or igloo in much more extreme climates than we have here, there must be a question then about what we can do with our attitudes and approach that will change that. Um, and one of the topics that has become very, very much at the front is how do you do ventilation, for instance, natural ventilation in a city? And to do that, partly you need to have clean air. And London is just getting to that point now. And there are projects just beginning to be done where the natural ventilation, the, the PPMs, the particulate matters in the air are such that it's starting to become safe to do that. That is a huge change. And think what that would do when suddenly your windows are openable and safe to do so. It's just a massive change of building infrastructure as well that perhaps we don't need in the same way. And that, that, that to mind is really, really quite interesting. And we're on the cusp of that already happening. So, yeah. Yeah. So as, as a slight kind of build out for that and, you know, there, there was a kind of stark donut with biodiversity shown, shown by far the biggest red bit in it and you know kind of again a wonderful example of the the old armory that you were talking about and what you've done there and bringing you know kind of green and foliage back into the that built environment just reflecting again back that maybe to the kind of city environment what more can we do in the built environment of somewhere like the city of London or London Metropolitan to actually kind of encourage better di di biodiversity in that built environment? Can we be doing more or are we doing enough? We can always do more. And, and one of the things I didn't really talk about in that talk was we talk about zero carbon. And the other part of the equation is there's a lot of things around resilience because things don't happen evenly and people have different interests or buildings have different demands partly because of when they were built or how they were built and uh zero what we can be is much more ambitious than zero carbon we can be carbon negative you know and mm. where some buildings will be more will take longer to reduce their carbon footprint particularly if they're you know the use of high energy buildings of which there are a lot and they have a value right value to society as well as within the market then other buildings short term maybe should be going way beyond zero carbon and what they should be producers not just of clean energy and that again can be done and um so when we were doing the 8000 home development for zero carbon that's 20 years ago remember so it's pretty slow in catching up the political will and the economic incentives with what Brundtland was talking in 1987, you know. So it's very timely that we're sort of getting on with it. Um, I lost my thread for a minute. Oh, yeah. So that how you bring those together, I, I, yeah, I, I think we'll demand different things. And zero carbon negative can be done. So it's a question then where we can, perhaps we should. And coming back to your greening question about, you know, biodiversity, there is new legislation now coming out about um, greening factors for buildings and cities, you know, and that is a desirable thing. It has to be done in the right way. There's a whole balance of complex issues and interests. But yeah, the, the movement is is happening. And some, yeah, some wonderful things. Well, I think we should have a belief in humanity that we can do this really. and get behind it and because there's a lot happening already and we can build on that yeah brilliant i'm just spying that time is now getting against us so you, you've ended on such a beautifully positive note there paul so i'm gonna leave that as the last hanging comment for our our audience so um i think I, I've, I've got a, a little bit of admin to do around uh some of the upcoming lectures which are on the screen so i i, I, I won't i won't put too much more reading into that than uh, other, I'll put a shout out for the first one because as the, the, the master of the company entrepreneurs, it's one of my freemen uh, who's who's giving giving the one about the UK-India relationship. And I'm chairing the Duck to Water with uh, a good friend, Sean Jones, which is talking about the use of uh, Lego serious play to uh, unlock our design thinking and use our 10 little brains that we have in our fingers as well as 
as that brain sitting in there. So there's a couple of personal plugs in there, but other lectures as well, uh, the resilience against the global terror threat being massively important. So urge everyone to dial into those. So look, it's just some quick thank yous. Um, thank you to the audience for, for listening, tuning in, staying with us for the questions, everything that's come out. It's you that, that, that make these such great uh, things to do. You, know, you clearly, Paul, thank you. You make this a great thing to do for the, the expertise that you, you share in such an informative and, uh, and entertaining way. Um, thank you. And obviously always to the, to the Lord Mayor for putting this series together. I think it's, it's a massively valuable part of what he's done in his year. So uh, I shall leave us there. I, I, I will just wish you a happy rest of the week. We've only got one more day to go before the the long weekend gets upon us, so we can all look forward to that. And I believe that the sun is shining, so we can build up those solar panel energy reserves for us for uh, for the next week. So there we are. So once again, Paul, thank you, and goodbye, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>